Moment. Aber okay, ich glaube, es geht das schon. Ich habe ein Terminal hier. Moment. Okay. Ups. Aber ich muss den Sound ausschalten. Boa tarde a todos. Uh, é meu prazer apresentar para vocês o palestrante dessa tarde, o professor Christian Klassen. So, uh, so that he understands us, let me present him in English. Uh, I met Christian uh, some time ago while he was still a PhD student. Uh, Christian did his studies in Munich. Uh, he studied mathematics in Munich at Ludwig Maximilian University. And he did his PhD also uh, in the TU Munich. Uh, so he finished the PhD in 2006. And after that, he went to Graz. He worked with Professor Kunisch. And he did his habilitation in mathematics at the Karl Frenzens Universität in Graz. So uh, Christian now is a W2 professor at the University of Duisburg Essen. Uh, his main uh, research areas are inverse problems, imaging and optimal control. Uh, he wrote over 50 scientific papers in several different uh, well-known paper uh, journals and with a lot of different collaborators, uh, experts in, in many of these areas that I just mentioned. And it's my pleasure to introduce you today, uh, Professor Christian Klassen, and he's going to talk about non-smooth regularization of a coefficient inverse problem for the wave equation. Thank you very much, Christian, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much for the invitation to give a talk in your nice colloquium. I would have loved to be there and you know, stand in front of you instead of sitting in my uh, study here. Um, but it's always a pleasure to, uh, to talk to Antonio. And as he said, we've met each other for a while and of, continuously over these years, and it's always been a pleasure. So what I want to talk today about is non-smooth regularization of an inverse problem for the wave equation. So this is um, part of a research program that goes back actually to my time in Graz. And it's, one of, it's kind of a, like a Trojan horse for me to keep the contact there alive as well. So this is joint work with Karl Kunisch there and Philip Trautmann, who is a postdoc in Graz. And parts of it are also work done by my former PhD student, Tram Do, who is now in Hamburg, actually, on a postdoc. And the idea is to, to identify a distributed coefficient, the wave speed in a wave equation, with regularization terms that are non-differentiable and thus allow structural information um, that is not possible to do with smooth regularization terms like L2 norms or uh, H1 semi-norms, that sort of thing. And just to put a face on, on things, what I'm trying to do here is to solve optimization problems of, of this form here, which often arise in, in optimal control problems and optimization problems and also in inverse problems where you're looking for some unknown coefficient u which should be optimal in at the same time in two senses one they should minimize a very abstract data discrepancy term which involves for example in my context the solution of differential equations. So you're looking for a constant um, a coefficient, a right-hand side, a boundary condition in a partial differential equation. You take this coefficient, you solve the partial differential equation, you get a corresponding state, a solution of the differential equation, and you compare this to measurements. And this goodness of fits to measurements, this is what the discrepancy term measures. So you want to make it small, to have a good agreement with your measurements. But an inverse problem would be boring if that is all you had to do. Simply trying to fit noisy data will be horrendously unstable. So you need to 
increase stability, impose stability by adding a sort of regularization term or a penalty term of this sort here. So this norm of u means we want to keep it small. We want to keep this reconstruction from exploding just to make a better fit to the data. So balancing this data fit and this regularization term is crucial to get a good reconstruction. This is controlled by this parameter alpha here. So this is inverse problems in a nutshell, trying to fit data and keeping stability by tuning this alpha parameter here. And the key point of, of my talk, of this work here, is this capital U, the set in which I'm looking for my parameter. And this has a very, very specific structure. Name is given here. So it is a function living on some domain omega, let's say a three-dimensional space, the, the room I'm in, the room you are in, maybe it's two-dimensional, it's a simplification of something, but it is a distributed function that has a value at every point in a given domain. And it can be a different value. And what I want to know here is, I do know a priori what kind of values they are can only be two or three or four different values, magnitudes, but I do not know where they are. For example, I have a medical imaging problem. I know I have bone, I know I have skin, I know I have muscle tissue, I know I have cancer, and all of these have different material properties. So I know that these are the possible values that can occur, but I do not know where they are in the domain. So I want to constrain my reconstruction to one that, have, that is piecewise constant, but with constants that are given a priori. So this is a hybrid discrete continuous problem because the, the topology is continuous. You're looking for a distributed function that can in principle take in arbitrary values, but you constrain it to discrete values. So for example, I said this is materials in in medical imaging, it could be voltages or velocities if you go back to optimum control problems. And in all of this here, I make the implicit assumption that these values u1 to ud can be ranked by magnitude, meaning that smaller values are better. So if, if the data does not tell me that I should pick u2 or u3, I should better pick the smaller one because this will be more stable. So this is basically the role of this, um, keeping the norm small here, smaller norm means more stable reconstruction. Um, and, and the same effect here is by this ranking by magnitude. So the first idea is, um, this is a horribly difficult problem because of this, um, discreteness, so this is a non-convex set because a con convex combination of a function that is u1 everywhere and a function that is u2 everywhere, for example, taking the average of this, this will not have an admissible value. So the average of u1 and u2 is not an admissible value. So this, this average is not in the set, so we cannot um, take convex combinations. So we have a non-convex optimization problem. This is very, very difficult numerically and theoretically. So one thing you can do is you can go to the convex relaxation, which in this case means I replace this discrete set of u1, u2, u3, u4 by its convex hull, which is just the interval between u1 and ud. And you can immediately see what is going wrong with that. Namely that no matter how many values you started with, u2, u3, u4, they do not show up in this constraint, right? If you had u1, u2, ud, or u1, u2, u3, ud, leads to the same. In fact, the only occurring values, so if d is equal to 2, and then in fact this is a very common um, approach in, 
in discrete optimization and in the context of optimal control, this is known as bang bang control because it leads to it leads actually to solutions which either hit the lower bound, this is one bang, or they hit the upper bound, and this is the other bang, but they do not have any value in between. So now here comes the uh, the key idea of this work, of, of this, this whole approach, is that you do this, you add this, you add the convex relaxation, but you also add a new regularization term that is built in a way so that the interior u2, u3, up to u d minus one values are also in some sense exposed. That these are promoted um, in optimization. And the idea comes from the well-known sparsity optimization where you have the L1 norm as a minimizer, where you have the structure that your solution, if you minimize the L1 norm as a realization term, you try to have a solution which is on as much zero as possible, which means you have a, because this is the kink of this L1 norm, this absolute value, and it will always be more expensive to move out of this kink with a linear growth than making this discrepancy term smaller. So there's several ways of motivating why this works. But the idea here is that we build our realization term in a way that we do not have a kink at zero, but we have kinks at all of these desired values. And I should, we'll see a picture in a second, but I should stress that this is of course not an exact relaxation. So going from the non-convex to the convex world, you may lose something and it will become important to discuss what you can lose. So to put a face to it, as I said, this is the sort of penalty I'm talking about. So you have here three different desired values, um, zero, one, and two. And you build basically this piecewise linear structure with the kings there by taking the quadratic norm by saying zero should have the value zero, of course, uh, one should have the value one, and then one half, and two should have the value four, so it grows quadratically, and then you restrict to the feasible solutions and then take the convex envelope, and this is exactly what it looks like. So basically, if you want to minimize this, you always slide to the closest kink and then you stick there. This is the idea. And we call this multibank control or multibank penalty um, because it kind of has the structure of the well-known bang-bang control from optimal control. But now, of course, you have these kinks, and that means you are non-smooth. There's a non-differentiable structure here. So you need to use special tools to actually compute the minimizers, the solutions of this inverse problem. And this is what I want to talk to you about in my first part. So the first part was actually this overview, which was very slow. And I will go quicker and quicker because it becomes more and more details and less about ideas. The second part will be to, to talk about how to minimize such a function involving this multibank penalty. Then I want to talk about what this penalty will do if you use this realization term for an inverse problem. So talking about the realization properties, talking about how inverse problems, solutions to inverse problems look like if I, if I use this on a very academic example. And then I want to talk about how the, the topic of the talk, if you will, in the title, how to do this for a coefficient inverse problem for the wave equation, where you also have to add a total variation penalty, and this combination we will see will make things much more complicated and interesting. And then of course talk about how to solve this numerically. Okay, in a nutshell, the idea is basically convex analysis. So the convex analysis is the theory of how to 
compute minimizers, characterize minimizers of convex but non-differential optimization problems. We're looking for a minimizer of this sort of composite problem. F here is this data discrepancy term, which depends on the specific inverse problem you're talking about. And G is the regularization term, which for us is going to be this multibank penalty. And the key idea is that um, you will have you talk about minimizers by looking at points where you have a tangent with a horizontal slope. There's a very geometric notion that immediately leads to the standard Fermat principle for differential optimization, meaning the derivative vanishes. So if I want to minimize a scalar function, I set the derivative equal to zero. The derivative is the unique slope or, or the ten, it's the slope of the unique tangent to the function graph at this point. And what we lose by going to the non-differential setting is that the tangent may no longer be unique. So in the convex world, we always have a tangent, but there might be multiple ones. And this all says there may be multiple ones, but one of them has to be horizontal. One of them has to have slope zero. So this is basically an equivalent reformulation of, of the optima optimality in the top. Now comes the tricky part. This is where you actually have to work. You want to have calculus rules to um, characterize this generalized derivative in terms of simpler ones which you can actually compute. And the two main calculus rules which you use here are the sum rule, which allows to split the set into the sum of two sets, meaning there has to be one Lagrange multiplier, basically P, which is in one set and minus which is in the other set. And we will see how we can use this, this Lagrange multiplier for characterizing our desired solution. And, and one nice thing, the second nice thing is the so-called Fenchel duality, which is basically an inverse function theorem. It tells you that you can invert this relationship here, minus p is in the subdifferential of g at u, into something explicit, saying that u is in the subdifferential of the Fenchel conjugate. So this means if I have a p, I can plug this into this relation and it tells me immediately something about u. There's another thing you can do, and this is interesting for numerics. You can reformulate these conditions as these sort of fixed point equations. So the difficulty, <clears throat> excuse me, the difficulty here in the first relation is that you have sets, and which means you have to pick the right element of a set. And this is difficult to solve numerically. But these things here, these you can show are Lipschitz continuous explicit equations. So they're fixed point equations which you can solve basically with a fixed point iteration. And of course, you, for this, you have to know how these so-called proximal point mappings look like. And we will do this for the specific penalties we're looking at in a second. So the corresponding fixed point iteration looks like this. So here, um, if we already add our solution mapping for the PDE here to, to introduce this early. This is what it looks like. You have your guest parameter k. You have a guess of the Lagrange multiplier. You apply the adjoint Frege derivative. This is like a solution of an adjoint equation. You look at the data misfit. You basically back propagate this. You get a new guess. You have this extrapolation step here, which is necessary to, uh, to turn these sep um, for the optimality condition. So these are, you need this step here to prove that the iteration converges. And this generalized setting here is well known in imaging and inverse problems as the Chambol-Poc method. 
for linear operator k. And this version here, here is specifically for a nonlinear operator. And this was introduced by Tomo Valkunin in 2014 in the discrete imaging context. And we worked on this in, in the context of PDEs and infinite dimensional spaces later on. So tau and sigma here are just step sizes which you have to pick. They have to satisfy some conditions under which you have basically a contraction mapping and can show convergence. You can actually show that this converges under some sort of local convexity conditions, which I do not want to go into detail here. And also uh, you can tune these extrapolation and the, the step sizes optimally in the sense of Nesterov if f or g are strongly convex, basically are quadratic functions. Yeah. But this is also something I don't want to go into here. Okay, so the takeaway message is because we have defined our penalty by acting pointwise with these scalar functions that we just integrate over, which act on the pointwise value of the coefficient, because we are only interested in enforcing these values independently at every point in the domain. All of these computations, all of these rules can be done pointwise. So all of this basically reduces to scalar manipulations, which are maybe tedious, but are not very challenging analytically. But in the end, you can just apply very general rules relating um, the subdifferential, the proximal mapping, the Fenchel conjugate of this G acting on functions to the same object of this lowercase g acting on scalar values. And that makes it very efficient because all these prox mappings can be done in parallel independently for each point. So for the multibank penalty, this is what it looks like. This is exactly the this convex hull, this, this example I gave as a figure earlier. This is just a piecewise linear function between two admissible values, it's linear with an average slope. And then you have an offset here, which makes it continuous basically, right? So it's just a piecewise linear function with a given slope that depends on, well, where you are between which of these values you are. And then it's fairly easy to show that these, that a piecewise linear function, if you differentiate this, of course, inside the pieces, you have to have exactly that slope. This is this branch here. And the only non-smoothness arises at the point where you are in one of these kinks, where you have multiple tangents, where basically you have to take the convex hull between all, between the slope from the left and the slope from the right, right? So you have all possible slopes between the one from the left and the one from the right. So this is the mul multi-valuedness which makes the, the problem challenging. Right, and the Fenchel conjugate, as I said, is just the inverse function. You basically only have to switch the roles of the argument and, and the value, right? So we have one value in an interval, here you have an interval at a specific value. And you can immediately see why this is interesting because if you look at the case distinction here, these are large intervals. And here you have the, these prescribed values occurring. And only in these d minus one exceptional points could you get something which is not one of the desired values. So this tells you already, just like sparse optimization, that this penalty will have some chance of enforcing the desired structure. And you can use this to define the proximal mapping. This is the definition of the proximal mapping. Basically, it's an implicit Euler step for a gradient descent, if you will. Right. So by, by definition, W is the proximal mapping of V if V is in the is in this set. So W plus 
a scalar multiple of this set here. And because you have this base point here, basically, you can show that this is a unique point. So for every V, there's, there's one and only one W. And if you look at this relation here, if you write down the definition of the subdifferential from the case distinction earlier, and you do a, well, you, you just go through the case distinction and simplify, you see that this is exactly what you get. So this proximal mapping is UI in this set here, which is a slightly um, smaller set than before. And these sets have become smaller to make room for this linear function here that connects u1 to or ui to ui plus one. So basically, you have a projection onto the desired values ui, but the projection has to be continuous. So you need to insert the uh, a linear function that connects them. So if if you go back, you have this this structure here where at one point you have a whole interval, you go from constant, you have a whole interval, another constant, and what you do now is you shift this slightly, uh, so you have constant linear function, constant, and so it's one valued, and that makes it easier. So it's just a generalization of the well-known soft thresholding operator from sparse minimization. So if you know FISTA from sparse minimization, and this is exactly the, the analog for the multibank penalty. Okay, so now we have these tools at hand. We, we can work with them. So what does this tell us about inverse problems, right? So inverse problems mean I have specifically my discrepancy term F here of the following form, where, my, where I have a solution operator maybe for a differential equation, which takes this u and spits out a corresponding solution y, which I compare in a suitable norm to some noisy measurement y delta, where I only know that the noise level in the norm is bound by some delta. So delta is large, I have very lo large noise, inexact measurements, delta is small, I have exact measurements. And this means, and this I use to tune my parameter alpha. And again, I try to, I know possible values for my parameter, and I want to find where in the domain omega are these attained. And I do this with this multivariate penalty. Okay, so these are the things you want to know in a regularization. You want to know, is this well posed in the sense that for every y delta, for every alpha, do I get a unique minimizer? And the answer is yes simply by convexity of this, this penalty. By construction, this multibank penalty is convex. So we can use the abstract theory um, from, it goes back to Burger and Osher, the seminal paper in 2004, and Ottmar Scherzer's book in 2009, of course, Barbara Kaltenbacher's very nice book in, in 2012, and uh, Bangti Jin has also a very nice book on this. So this is by now things you teach in an upper level course on inverse problem, basically. So existence, you have a solution. The solution is stable, which means that if delta goes to zero, if your noise, if your data becomes more and more and more exact, um, you approach a, a corresponding minimizer of this functional. So small variations in, in the data lead to small variations in the reconstruction for alpha greater than zero, because this is definitely not true if alpha is equal to zero. And if you combine, if you take alpha to zero in the right speed compared to delta, meaning alpha has to go And you can show that this combined um, convergence, if you will, that your reconstructions converge to the true solution, meaning the u dagger is the one that gives rise 
by a KU dagger to a Y dagger, which is the solution for delta equal to zero. You want to do more, you want to have convergence rates, which means error estimates. You want to know if I have 10% data noise, how good can my reconstruction be? And this is in general not possible. You can prove that this is impossible unless you have more information about the solution. And this is given by a source condition, which is in this case of the following form that it's basically well, in this case, it's, it's a technical thing. It's in general a smoothness condition, which means um, your solution has additional properties which allow you to approximate it well by minimizers of such a function. That is basically the point. You, these are solutions that can be well approximated by a sequence of minimizers of this function, so we can hope to get convergence rates. And under these both standard choices of alpha independence of delta, you can show rates of delta, but you cannot show them in a norm, you cannot show them pointwise. You can only show them in this weak Bregman divergence, which basically tells you it's a sort of metrization of weak convergence plus convergence of the penalty values. So it's, a, it's a sort of strict convergence, if you will. So this does not tell you anything about pointwise convergence. And this is something where you can show for the specific multibank penalty a bit more, namely that you can use the pointwise definition of, the, of all these penalty objects, subdifferentials, Bregman divergences, and so on, that if your true solution is actually one that has the desired, a desired value at a point, and your this source condition is such that you are not. So if if we go back, this p dagger should be in the subdifferential at the true solution, and the subdifferential we already had has this set here that is inner set. This is the case we're interested in. Here we have a whole interval. And the extremal points are exactly the extremal points which I say these should not be attained. And then the Bregman distance goes to zero as delta goes to zero. So then we have pointwise information. There's a sort of strict complementarity condition if you know nonlinear optimization, Kosh Kontaka conditions, and so on. But if a true solution is not one of the desired values, but in between, then you can show that the, this Bregman divergence is actually constant to zero for any possible value you put in as long as it's in this interval. So that means convergence of the Bregman divergence does not tell you anything about your true solution or about the reconstruction in comparison to the true solution. Right? So then a simple Argument by contradiction shows that you even have pointwise convergence of the reconstruction, not only weak convergence, if and only if the true solution is actually um, given, actually has these right, if you guess correctly with the values you impose. But of course, this convergence is not uniform, and that means you cannot leverage it to pointwise rates. So the rates are still only going to be in the Bregman divergence. Okay. And now if you plug this into, if you do the, the computations from the Fermat principle, the sum rule, and so on, you get here the classical optimality conditions. This is something which you probably recognize from least square solution. This is just the backpropagated data residual. This is your p bar, your adjoint state. And this is then plugged into this case distinction, which I showed you pointwise. And then it, it tells you your reconstruction is one of these nice points. If I'm in these sets qi, these are the intervals. And if I'm 
the, the open intervals. And if I'm at one of these points where the intervals meet, then I can have something that is in between them. So only in these, on these singular sets here, where the adjoint state, this backpropagated data residual, is exactly one at this specific average value, this is the point where I might have not one of these desired values. Now you can play more games if you know something about this k here, this operator, for example, if it's the solution operator for an elliptic PDE, you have a harmonic solution, this cannot be constant unless it's zero. So that means it cannot be this constant in particular, and that means you can exclude a priori the case that this singular set here is attained, and then you can say, okay, as long as I have any noise in my data, my reconstruction will be only from these prescribed values. So this is a hard constraint. So this is, I, in this case, I don't lose anything. This reformulation is exact. And to show you how this works, we'll do this with a very, very simple example where I'm basically solving an inverse source problem for the Laplace equation. So my K is the solution operator for the Laplace equation, and my U is just the right-hand side. And this is piecewise constant. It has a background U1 and a inclusion U2, and a smaller inclusion inside the bigger inclusion with the value U3. And so there's a 10, either 50% or a 10% contrast inside the small inclusion. So the idea is you want this background in medical imaging. This could be the sound speed of water, linearized, of course. U2 is, I don't know, muscle tissue. And you're looking for a, for a tumor there, which you know is slightly stiffer than the, than the healthy tissue. And then you add some noise to the measured data. And in this case here, we use the semi smith newton method because it's a linear problem that works very well. And the alpha is chosen by the discrepancy principle, meaning you try to keep the residual in the range of the noise level delta, uh, which you assume to know. And this is what, you, what it looks like. So this is the true solution, which you try to recover. And if your noise is basically 20%, so this is a relative noise level, then the corresponding solution looks like this. As you can see, it's perfect in, in the given values, but you regularize a lot. It's a lot of noise. So you have a high regularization parameter. The alpha is large. And what this alpha does is it tells you that the larger values this yellow region is too expensive. It tries to explain it only with the green region. But if you reduce the noise not to 0.2%, then you take a smaller alpha. These values will be cheaper. They will be used more often, and you get a um, better reconstruction. And you can see you get perfect contrast, but of course, the, the domain is smaller. You, you have a geometric underestimation, but the contrast is perfect. And then if you reduce delta further, of course, it's you have convergence as you would expect. And this is pointwise convergence because you have you prescribe the exact values. So with only 10% contrast, it's harder to see here. Um, you get the same behavior. Um, here, of course, uh, the step from 0.1 to 0.11 is, is smaller. Uh, so it's trying, so the inclusion is smaller, but again, if you reduce the noise, you get pointwise convergence to the true solution. And, and here now, this is a bit harder to see. This is the case where we do not have the exact solution as pointwise, as attaining the pointwise values. So the background and the first inclusion is still exact, but this is now a linear slope between points. It's a, it's a linear slope, but the reconstruction is trying to use only the given values, point 0.1 and point 0.12. 
And now if I reduce delta and reduce the alpha accordingly, I still get weak convergence, but I no longer get pointwise convergence. So it will, you will get this, um, this weird phenomenon where it doesn't know on a domain anymore whether to go up or go down. So every point chooses for itself. Some take the upper value, some take the lower value, and you get this oscillating behavior with faster and faster oscillations. So this is exactly what you would expect from weak but not pointwise convergence. But still, of course, you have convergence. Um, as delta goes to zero, you will converge to the this linear slope. Okay. I'm, I'm there again. I'm sorry, my internet seems to drop out briefly. Um, everybody's already watching Netflix here in Germany, so the, yeah, the net is congested. Okay, I've already talked too long, so I only want to very briefly touch what happens if we want to go to coefficient inverse problems for the wave equation, because this becomes technical. So the idea here is now that the coefficient u enters into the differential operator here. And you're solving a time-dependent wave equation. And from traces, you want to recover the wave speed. So, so the problem here is very technical. Um, that means that you um, need to use the right topology for, for this um, problem here. So for this equation to be well posed, u bar has to be, the, the coefficient has to be an infinity essentially bounded with up and lower bounds away from zero. And this is a topology that is not weakly star closed, which means that um, I can have a minimizing sequence for my functional that, so I have a sequence u n which I can successively insert into my function, and I will get smaller and smaller values. But there's no coefficient that will make the limit of this uh, value of functional values, right? So the minimal value, there's a minimal value of my functional, but it does not correspond to any solution of this PDE. That's a well-known effect in homogenization if you want to know more about this. Um, this phenomenon. So you need to do more. So just looking at pointwise values is not enough. You have to add total variation regularization because combined with L infinity, this will give you compact embedding into LP. So that means your weekly star converging sequence of, of minimizers is even converging strongly in LP. That means you can pass to the limit in this equation in the right form to show that the limit is actually solving such an equation. So the idea is you need additional regularization that is not only acting pointwise, but enforces some sort of regularity on the level sets of the re reconstruction, right? But now you have immediately another problem pops up because to apply the sum rule, you need to have continuity. So there are some conditions, regularity conditions, you need to apply to be able to pick apart these functionals to, to work with these proximal mappings. And you cannot do this if you have total variation and this, um, this indicator function, this, this cut off hard enforcing of upper and lower bounds. And so something has to give, and what you can show is what is sufficient is to basically remove this projection, this, this, this hard cut off as a constraint from the problem and move it into the equation as a projection, as a cut off. And if you want to differentiate, if you want to get optimality conditions, you have to do this in a way that it remains differentiable. So it has to be a smooth sigmoid type. Um, project, um, mapping instead of a hard cutoff projection. And in this case, then you can use higher regularity of solutions to the wave equation that give you better regularity of this adjoint mapping 
to work in nicer topologies to get point-wise information out. So this is basically the, the goals. This becomes a bit technical. Maybe I will skip this. So you, the idea is you work with the weak form of the equation. You use the standard theory by Leon Magines to get the proper continuity and regularity map properties of solution of this equation and of the adjoint equation under some assumptions that your initial data is not supported, where you are actually trying to recover the coefficient, you can show that you have, by a bootstrapping argument that you get basically maximal hyperbolic regularity, which is just enough to move away from these nasty um, non-reflexive spaces, L1, L infinity, to reflexive spaces lp for p greater than one can be will be not much greater than one but every little bit counts and in this setting you can show that here this mapping from u to this norm is differentiable even Frégé differentiable this derivative has better regularity um, which you then used to apply the sum rule to get something which is basically pointwise in space. So this is what it looks like. You have the same structure. This is the derivative of the discrepancy term. This is the generalized derivative of the multibank term. And this is the generalized derivative of the total variation. And because of this tricks with the higher regularity, you can actually interpret these in a pointwise fashion similar to what I showed to you in the last part for the simple linear um, and yeah, convex problem. Right. For the numerical solution, you do not want to deal with all this nastiness. What you do is you discretize by finite elements. Then you have a finite dimensional problem. And then you don't need all these um, reflexive, non-reflexive bits. You can just use the multibank penalty as in the last part, including this, this hard cutoff. You can use the chain rule for the total variation to reduce it basically to the one norm acting on a discrete gradient and a discrete divergence. So this is standard from imaging. Um, these are basically finite, diff or finite element operators, which are easy to, to assemble. And then you can apply the nonlinear primal dual proximal splitting method, as I've already said, in the form of Valkonen, because we have a nonlinear mapping from the sound speed to the solution of the wave equation. Now you have a bit of a problem because you have three terms. You have the discrepancy term f here, but your g is actually the sum of two terms, namely this multibank norm and the total variation norm. So the prox mapping will be difficult. And the idea is to lift this by um, considering this as an independent mapping here, um, where you have the operator, you, you take, you move the, instead of having the sum here, you have a vector of two components here by taking the operator here as the, um, well, the, the, the solution operator of the PDE and the gradient and having these as independent variables of your tracking term, if you will. If you do this, then this is how it ends up. Basically, you just have an, another term here in your back propagation term. This is basically the divergence acting on on this additional variable psi, which you move. This is the proximal term for the L2 norm. It's basically a, um, a dampening term. It's a dampened back propagation, which you do here. And this is the update for the total variation term and onto the L infinity ball. And this is what's done here, this is basically just a pointwise um, projection of this two component vector in two dimensions onto the unit ball. 
So this is, all of these steps are very easy to, uh, to implement this, this, and this is basically the solution of the wave equation by a finite element method. This is this soft thresholding operator. And this is just, you can write this down explicitly. And this is pointwise. And this is here, my, my last set of slides, just a numeric example. This is a transmission example. So this is the coefficient which you want to reconstruct here. It's very challenging. You have so time dependent sources that fire. I, I will, good example. I, I will show these slides briefly and then comment on these questions. So basically you have a time dependent source here in front and you measure the trace of the solution in the back here. So you have a transmission example and you want to reconstruct this coefficient with these four different values. And this is what happens if you use only the multibang penalty. You enforce exactly these values, but you have no spatial regularity. It's not a well posed problem. So you get this fitting of noise. This goes away if you only have total variation. But then, of course, here you lose this. Yes. Yes, I'm very close to the end. So I'll just finish this and then answer the questions. So the so here you lose the desired values. You're a bit below and a bit above. And if you add both total variation and multibang, you get your perfect agreement and here as well. But again, since you have some regularization in, in the multibang, the most expensive ones, they're too expensive they will get dampened slightly. And this is what happens if you, because this is a usual question, what happens if you guess wrong? So the same exact coefficient, but now I, I'm guessing that my values are 10% higher. And as you can see, I do get, um, it, it's not as good. I, I lose this correct, um, implementation uh, enforcement here, but I do get here the correct 0.2 and 0.1. So I'm, I'm getting some benefit of this multibank penalty, even if I'm guessing incorrectly, of course, as long as I don't guess too incorrectly. So, and this is the last thing I wanted to say. Um, I hope I convinced you that this is an interesting approach for solving piecewise constant with known constants, inverse problems. It works even for nonlinear problems combined with total variation. Um, there's much more you can do, which I will not comment on, um, but you can ask, of course. And if you want to know more, all my papers and the codes I used are on my webpage. So uh, please make them, please try them and tell me if they work or if they don't. So thank you for sticking with me. That was a long talk. Now I'm answering the questions. <laughs> OK, thank you, Christian. Oh, there are some questions already in the chat. Can you see them? Yes. Uh, in the linear example, how relevant is the qualitative behavior shown due to the usage of the discrepancy principle? How do other parameter choice rules behave? Um, they behave in general similar, but as always, they're very, um, so one thing is the discrepancy principle over regularizes usually. So this is, um, since you're only looking at the data misfit, you're always looking at things in smoother norms. So you always over regularize. So this is basically why you if I go back quickly. Yeah, this is the reason why, you, why you're losing it. This. this is a very bad reconstruction for 10%, um, 20% noise. If you use an a priori choice rule with a tuned constant, so an a priori choice rule would be saying alpha is a constant multiple of delta. And if you tune this constant multiple by for some, I don't know, specific value which you can take as a reference, 
then you can get much better reconstruction. But of course, this is then cheating a bit. You have to add additional information into the parameter choice rule. And one thing that would be interesting is to do heuristic choice rules adapt to these pointwise penalties, but we have not come up with one so far. Ah, exactly. And your question alpha is C times delta. So a priori choice rules. So um, you can tune them much better. So they work as well. So the, uh, the, uh, the results are similar. But of course, it's easier to tune the C to give you visually better reconstructions for a given delta. While the tau in the, if I go back here, so the C and the tau, these are meta parameters which you should choose. And you can choose the C much in a much, you have much more freedom in choosing the C. You can choose it 10 to the minus three. You can choose it order one. They're all valid, while for the ip, for the tau here, they basically have to be between one and two. That's what the theory tells you. So, yeah. I hope this answers the question somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, when comparing the a priori choice with the a posteriori choice, uh, what works better? What is your experience? Well. Morozov is more robust. A priori is, can be more exact. If you take the C to be very, very small, then you can get much better visual reconstruction for an, a normal noise level. But of course, one has to say all these results are asymptotic results. They only tell you for delta to zero, you converge to the true solution. What you it does not tell you anything about the reconstruction quality for a given delta. For this, you will need pointwise um, error estimates. You need to have convergence rates. Common problem with a priori choices is that you must know the noise level. But I see that here for the a priori choice, you also have the same difficulty. Yes. Only heuristic choice rules are ones where you do not need to know the noise level. Yes. And the, can, and these do not work so well on, on this problem, I have to admit. So you probably want something adapted for these um, non-smooth point-wise methods. I haven't come up with one yet. Mm, interesting, interesting. And uh, are you aware of uh, the use of method Lagrangian approaches for this kind of problems? There are, in imaging, people use omitted Lagrangian a lot. They're very, very similar to the the, the Chambord-Hoc method with a different sign. So um, I don't actually see any reason to use an augmented Lagrangian approach if I can use the Chambord-Hoc method or these primal dual splitting methods. They They have better theoretical properties, I would say. I see. And for the numerical realizations, the, the omitted Lagrange approach does not bring any improvement. Well, I, I should say EDM, alternating direction minimization. So that's specifically. So um, ILM is basically, uh, I wouldn't know. So I, ILM would be to add a sort of penalization To this, to to this, to add another penalization of the constraint that you are taking a value from this point right set, which I'm already mm -hmm. doing basically with the multinate penalty. So I'm, I don't quite see. Um, how this would help here, I have to admit. Okay, okay. For the total variation, you're right, you could do this augmented Lagrangian, you, you could and then add a, an augmented Lagrangian for this constraint. But this is use the same norms, the same as Chambord-Hoc with a different sign for the Lagrangian. 
Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, understanding imaging, people tend to use omitted Lagrangian and they claim that it brings better results. Although it's questionable because you penalize twice the same constraint, once with a vector multiplier and another with a scalar multiplier. So. With these things, you have to be very, very careful in, in how you compare to make sure that you're comparing apples and apples. That you're, I mean, this is very clear. You have, you have to be very clear about this, about saying what is the goal and so that you're comparing. So if you're mixing different formulations and different methods, then it already becomes a bit murky what you are comparing, which is better, the method or the formulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christian, thank you. Uh, there is a student asking about the example with the wave vacation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just saw here a, a question about your example with the wave equation. And she wants more details about the space of bounded variation functions. Oh, um, basically, it's in a nutshell, it's the weakest space where you have something like like a gradient. So the idea is to have, it's like a Sobolev space. So there is, you can define the gradient of, of a function. So let's say in 1D, uh, you can take the derivative, but the derivative is not a function, but it's a measure. Right? So you can differentiate, for example, something that has a kink or a jump. That's, that's the point. You can differentiate something that has a jump because you you look at the jump in a very very the point where it jumps in very very weak sense where it makes sense to have um, the derivative of a jump as a delta distribution right so it's basically the space of functions where derivatives Meaning are meaningful in a weak sense in the space of measures. So for example, they could be a point measure, they could be a line measure, so you could have piecewise constant functions that jump in a point in 1D or along a line in 2D. And of course, once you deal with measures, things become a bit difficult in differentiating and so on. But it's this is an interesting topic. There's books on on this, which I would refer to, for example, the book by Otmar Scherzer. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are there are books on, on, on BV or, functions. Or maybe the mathematical imaging book by Christian Bredis and Dirk Lorenz. I think that's a good one. Oh that's, yes, indeed, indeed. That's in English now, they have an English translation out. Um, ah. in that. Uh, there is the book of Ivan Zagariapi, which also is very good. That is very good but for yeah. analysts and not for ma mathematical imaging people. Yes, yes, this is it. It's a very good book, too. Okay, so Christian, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. So uh, it's already at 10 past three, so we don't want to exploit you. <laughs> Your slides were uh, very clear. Uh, would you mind to make the slides available to the students? Uh, I, would, the... I can send them to you and I will put them on my web page so you can just send the link around. Okay. And if you agree, the recording of your talk will, uh, a copy of that will stay on the, uh, oh my God, what is the name of the, it's not Facebook, it's the other one, it's the, well. <laughs> <laughs> I would not agree to Facebook, I have to say. No, it's not Facebook. It's the other one. I just forgot the name. Uh, YouTube, probably. YouTube, exactly. Yeah, we have a channel for the for the colloquium at the YouTube, and the talks. The if the guest allows, they remain recorded at YouTube, and so you can take a look at it after that. I will uh, not. <laughs> I don't have to look at it, then I'm fine with it being online. Okay, Christian, thank you very much uh, for accepting the invitation. It was a pleasure receiving you here. And let's hope that uh, sometime soon uh, I will be able to invite you once again to come to Florianopolis and you'll be able to deliver uh, a talk, uh, a present. I would like that very much. A, a present uh, conference, yeah. <laughs>
a talk here. So thank you very much. Uh, let me say farewell to the students. Um, muito bem, obrigado a todos pela presença e na próxima sexta-feira nós continuamos com mais uma palestra do Colóquio às 14 horas. Muito obrigado, um abraço a todos e aqui eu me despeço.